We've been in Revelation now for about um, a year and a half. And uh, we still, we're on chapter 14. So that's where we'll be tonight. And we won't finish up chapter 14, not even close. You remember we started a couple of weeks ago in chapter 14, verse 6. But as a way of a quick uh, reminder, when we got into chapters 12 and 13, we saw the whole chronological events of tribulation, of the tribulation in the book of Revelation, seen with more of a satanic influence. We started to see, it's almost like a retelling of some of the events of the tribulation from satanic perspective. When we got into chapter 13, up through verse 10, 1 through 10, we saw the beast that came out of the sea, and we looked at quite, uh, quite in length at this beast that came out of the sea, how he represents the Antichrist and all. And we, we looked at that, we saw his wonder, remember, in verse 3, and we saw his worship, and we saw his words, and we saw the war, we saw all these things of the Antichrist, as we spent many weeks looking at the Antichrist in chapter 13, the verse 10 verses. Then in verse 11 to the end of chapter 13, we looked at that third person of the unholy trinity. We were looking in chapter 12 how the, dra the dragon representing Satan himself was one part of that unholy trinity as Satan was trying to mimic, to copy the ways of God. Throughout the book of Revelation, we see that even going so far as looking at the trinity and how the dragon, Satan himself, kind of mimics the position of the Father, and the Antichrist mimics the position of Christ. And then we saw the false prophet mimicking the position of the Holy Spirit, the unholy trinity, in chapters 12 and 13. And as we looked at chapters 12 and 13, we saw this false prophet. In verse 12, we saw his purpose, remember? Well, verse 11, we saw his profile. In verse 12, we saw his purpose. And then in verse 13, we saw his power. In verse 16 and 17, we saw his program. In verse 19, we saw 18, we saw his punishment. And as we just looked at this false prophet, but we saw the false prophet had caused the earth dwellers, those who had rejected Christ, who were still living on the earth in the midst of the tribulation after the rapture of the church. And many of the people who came to Christ after the rapture of the church, the tribulation saints, remember, many of them were martyred. And then we saw that these who rejected Christ, the false prophet, actually made them build this image and to worship this image of the Antichrist. So we'll look at that a little bit more tonight. And then we also saw the false prophet made the earth dwellers, those who rejected Christ and chose to worship the image of the Antichrist, the Antichrist worshipers, for them to be involved in commerce, for, those, for them to identify with the Antichrist and avoid the, the martyrdom that would go for those who refused the mark of this beast. He made them receive that mark. We'll be looking at that mark tonight as well. Then we got into chapter 14, and we looked at the first five verses, and we saw the 144,000. The same 144,000 that had received a mark from God, remember, on their forehead and on their right hands. And these 144,000, these Jewish evangelists who went out into the tribulation pro proclaiming the gospel. Now at the end of the tribulation, we see that the Lord still had these 144,000. Not 143,000, 999. He had 144,000. Every one of them were sealed and preserved through the tribulation as they went out with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Then we came into verse 6, and we spent an entire evening, remember, just on verse 6 and 7. Last week, we just covered verse 8, and tonight we'll be in verses 9 through 11, <coughs> as we look at these three angelic messengers. Angelos means messenger. So it's sort of like a repeat when we say three angelic messengers, but that's who they are. Oftentimes today when we look at angels, remember we see them in the stores and around Christmas you see the little angels on top of the tree and you see the little cherubs, the soft little bubbly little guys and all, they're angels. But in scripture we see angels are anything but soft and bubbly. And we saw over these last couple of weeks, we saw that these angels are flying in the midst of heaven at the high point of heaven proclaiming with a loud voice. The first angel in verse 6, we saw this angel preaching the gospel, the everlasting or eternal gospel. And we see here God is giving these earth dwellers, those who have come through the tribulation, he gives them one last chance to hear the gospel and to repent. We see the mercy of God. We saw God giving the gospel through the two witnesses, and they were martyred. We saw God presenting the gospel through the 144,000. 
And now just before the end of the tribulation, it said in verse 6, Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, at the high point of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth. The earth dwellers. Throughout the book of Revelation, those who dwell on the earth, the earth dwellers, it's a name for those who have rejected Christ. These are the ones who are living, dwelling. Their, their roots are deep into the world. They have not been raptured. They have not come to Christ. These are the earth dwellers. And now the earth dwellers receive this gospel message one last time. Notice this angel preaches to every nation, every tribe, every tongue, every people. And we saw in the gospel when Jesus said that this gospel message would have to go out to the whole world, to all the nations, to all the tribes, all the tongue, all the people, that there are those today that say, well, that means we have to get out into missions and we have to present the gospel so Jesus can come back. He is not dependent on us. The gospel will go out to all the world right here with this angel. It's the only place in all the Bible where we see an angel proclaiming the gospel. The proclamation of the gospel God has given to people. To sinning people, we are the ones to profess, to proclaim the gospel. This is the only time an angel does, and it's because everybody has been raptured, martyred, there's very few left to proclaim, and God's going to put it across all the earth through this angel right here. To every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, they're all going to hear him, fear God, give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea, and springs of water. Then in verse 8, we see one angel, the first angel, preaching the gospel. Now we see another angel pronouncing judgment. The judgment that comes on those who reject the gospel. And another angel followed saying, Babylon is fallen. Last week we spent the whole evening looking at, well, half the evening looking at Babylon. The history of Babylon, all the way from the Tower of Babel, all the way to the end of the Bible with Babylon, religious Babylon, commercial Babylon being destroyed in chapters 17 and 18, and how Babylon fit into all of that, the history of Babylon and the whole bit. So we see here, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, repeated twice for emphasis, and many believe referring to the religious and commercial Babylon, chapters 17 and 18. We'll get there in a couple of well, in months. That great city, because she has made, she has forced all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and that is important. We saw that Babylon made all the people, made the nations drink of the wrath of her fornication. And we looked at that word wrath, remember. The word wrath was so interesting. There's two Greek words for wrath, translated out wrath in the English. Remember, the one word we've seen for all of our study throughout the Bible is the word orge. We talked about that. We're going to see it again tonight as we get into our text in just a minute. But remember orge wrath, O-R-G-E, orge wrath. Orge wrath deals with stored up wrath. It's a wrath that we can have as people pretty easily where someone just really steams us. We don't go crazy. We just... Mm. Anybody ever had orge wrath? So you know what it is. That's orge wrath. That's orge wrath. In the scriptures, that is the word for wrath throughout the Bible. Orge wrath. In fact, there's only one time where this other word, thymos, the other word for wrath, is used outside of the book of Revelation. Thymos wrath is not stored up wrath. That's when you lose it. That's when you lose it. Anybody ever have that kind of wrath? Lose it wrath? Yeah. It's a good picture is a dam. We talked about the Hoover Dam last week, remember? The water storing up. That's orge wrath. You can't tell it, but it's just there. And it gets more fuller and fuller. There's a lot of pressure there, but it's just orge wrath. And then all of a sudden, so much pressure, <laughs> the dam breaks. That's thymos wrath. The wrath of man can be the orge of man or the thymos of, ma of man. But when it comes to the wrath of God, it's always the orge wrath. It's that stored up wrath of God. One time in the book of Ephesians, it talks about the thymos wrath of God. When it talks about one day, God will let that thymos wrath pour out onto a Christ-rejecting world. But when we get to the book of Revelation, we see thymos wrath all over the place. Thymos wrath, thymos wrath, thymos wrath, the wrath of God. You see, we have not seen the thymos wrath of God yet. We haven't seen that. But one day, it will happen. So we looked at orge and thymos wrath, and it was talking about the thymos wrath of Babylon, of the end times, of the Antichrist, st stirring all this up. But now as we get into this third angel's message, the first angel preaching the gospel, the second angel pronouncing judgment on those who reject the gospel, but now we see the promising damnation of those 
who reject Christ. And this is where it gets crazy. There was a movie out a few years back. It was called Heaven is for Real. Anybody hear about that movie, Heaven is for Real? About a little boy, remember that whole thing? I didn't see it. I heard about it. I, I didn't get a chance to see it, but there it is. We're not going to study that tonight. <laughs> tonight we're going to study Hell is for Real. Do you know that Jesus taught on hell, spoke of hell much more than he ever spoke of heaven? Hell is for real. And yet the enemy, the world, and when we are in our sin, we tend to either think it's not real or we just put it in the back burner and we think, well, I said that prayer that one time at a concert. I remember I went forward. It was so cool. And I prayed that prayer. So I'm good. I don't have to live for Christ because I prayed that prayer. No, praying a prayer is much more I mean, getting saved and, and having our hope of eternity with Jesus is much more than just a simple prayer and then living our life like we always have lived it. Hell is very real. And uh, tonight, Merry Christmas. We're going to talk on hell. So here we go. Then a third angel followed them. We're going to have this up a lot. If you take notes, you might want to write that every time you see it. It's just, hell is for real. Hell is for real. Don't ever forget that. Hell is for real. So then a third angel followed these first two. And it's interesting, these three angels appear in a logical sequence. You reject the gospel, then you get a pronouncement of judgment. And that's followed by now the damnation described of those upon whom that judgment falls. Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, a loud voice. The gospel was preached to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people with a loud voice. We saw that in verse 7. Now we see this promise of damnation delivered with a loud voice. Everyone is going to hear. Everyone is going to understand. God being righteous, holy, he judges people. Why? Because they rejected what they know to be true. In Romans chapter 1, verse 20 and 21, you know that. It says that everyone who's sentenced to hell, basically, it says, will be without excuse. Even creation itself is evidence that God is. No excuse. No excuse. It says here another angel followed, say, or then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God. So as we look at this, we, we have the answer to the question. If someone's here and says, well, I want to drink of the wrath of God, here's how you do it during the tribulation. If you're here tonight and say, I'm just going to play church. I'm going to come to services. I'm just not going to live for Christ. I'm going to wait until the rapture happens, and if it really happens, then I'm going to give my life to Jesus, which we say, if you can't live for Christ now, there's no way in the world you're going to be able to die for him then. So if we're here and we're playing games with Jesus, you know, well, this is what it'll be like for the earth dwellers. If anyone worships the beast in his image, you want to drink of the wrath of God, you're in the tribulation, the first thing we want to do, we have to worship the beast and his image. In other words, we need to become part of Satan's false world religion of antichrist worship. Remember we said the false prophet will command the earth dwellers to build an image and to worship that image of the beast? There will be a worldwide worship of the Antichrist. We saw when we were studying that, remember Daniel chapter 3 with uh, Nebuchadnezzar? After he had the dream and Daniel interpreted the dream about the head of gold and of silver and of bronze, uh, silver, uh, gold, silver, bronze, and iron. And Nebuchadnezzar heard that, really, I'm the gold and there's going to be someone after me in silver? I don't think so. He makes this really weird formed image make out of gold, silver, bronze, and iron. He makes it out of all gold. He says, it's me. I'm forever. I'm gold. Puts it on the plains of Dura, flat area, this tall, skinny image. And he says, when you hear the music play, you fall down and worship that image. Remember, they all did it. Except for those three Hebrew boys. Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, remember. They refused to kneel down to the image. Well, that same type of thing is going to be going on on a worldwide basis at this time. The image will be made, if we look at 2 Thessalonians, in chapter 2, verse 4, we won't turn there, but you know what it is. It talks about th this, this 
Antichrist there in 2 Thessalonians chapter um, 2 verse 4. It says he sits as God in the temple of God showing himself that he is God and many people believe this image will be set up there on the temple mount during the tribulation period. This image that stresses the deity of the Antichrist shows that he has conquered death. Remember it said that he was wounded and then it appeared that he came to life. And then remember how the false prophet gave breath to this image and the word for breath there, we said it was not the typical Zoe or the Neos. It was, a, it was the word uh, pneuma which gives the appearance of life. We talked about technology at the time, how that could happen and all, remember. But it appears that he has conquered even death, this Antichrist. So people who hear that Jesus conquered death, well, so is he. And the world starts to worship him in, in mass numbers. We also saw in the book of Daniel chapter 9 and of course in Matthew chapter 24 that this worship of the image is associated with what is known as the abomination of desolation. So we see this abomination of desolation being set up in the holy place on the temple mount at, to, in the midst of the tribulation and worship demanded of this image that appears to come to life. And many, many, many people do. And we see here in chapter 14, this third angel says, if anyone worships the beast and his image, there's a connection we're going to see between worshiping the beast and receiving the mark of the beast. Notice what it says. If he worships the beast and his image and if he receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand. The two places, remember, in the Shema in Deuteronomy chapter 6, where God said, write these things and put them as, front on the, as frontless between your eyes and wrap them on your arm. And Satan again mimics the things of God. So now the Antichrist requires through the false prophet that this mark of the beast be put on their forehead or on their right hand. The word mark we talked about, terasso, in the Greek it means to engrave. It's a tattoo. It's a brand. It was given back in the Roman days to the soldiers, to the slaves, to devotees of religious organizations, religious cults. Paul uses this word mark in Galatians chapter 6, verse 7. Remember they were questioning, well, you're not really an apostle, Paul. You know, come on, you're not even part of the original 12. You didn't and he has to give his credentials. And at the end of the book of Galatians, in chapter 6 there, he says, nobody question me anymore because I bear on me the charuso, the marks of the Lord Jesus Christ. Could it be from his stoning in Lystra? Is that the marks? Could be. But he uses that same word. He says, I have been marked by Christ. So Paul talks about the mark. God sealed the 144,000, remember, on the head, on, on the forehead, so that they would be protected from the wrath of the Antichrist. The false prophet here marks the people, the earth dwellers, to protect them from the wrath of the Antichrist. So we see this mark. And he says, if you receive this mark, if you identify with the Antichrist, we saw as we studied the mark that it was required for commerce. If you were going to build, uh, buy something, you had to have this mark. Whatever this mark, however it plays out. We talked about chips. We talked about different ways of uh, could possibly happen. Who knows how it's going to be, but it's going to be very evident. And without it, you don't buy anything. Without it, you're going to starve. If you receive it, it's going to be worse than starving. So it becomes a very serious issue, worshiping the Antichrist, receiving the mark of the beast. Those receiving the mark, the earth dwellers, are going to believe they're doing the right thing. They're on the winning side, man. They're going to line up and be glad to take the mark of the beast and eat filet. Not a problem. Paul had marks on his body. There will be the mark of the beast, but today, right now, the question is, what mark are each of us bearing today out in society? What mark are we wearing today? Yvette, you're a new believer. I don't want to give you a big head because you're brand new, but at the same time, you did something so good, I got to say it. But what mark are you wearing, Yvette? What mark do you have on? Can you imagine? Can you imagine? You're a new believer, new to the church, and people come to you who profess to know Christ and say, we're partying this weekend. Come on. What's your mark? Her mark is, you know, I'm a Christian. I just can't do that. I give my life to Jesus. I'm not going to do that. That's a mark. What mark are you wearing? 
What is your mark? Is it a mark of Christ or is it a mark that I'm just kind of, I go to church, I'm a church goer, man. I go to church, but I deserve one night a week to go off and let my hair down, get a little high, come on. Really. This is not a game playing time, guys. You know why it's not a time to play games? Right there is why. Hell is for real. Hell is for real. Sin is a kick for a minute. But then what? Oh, to bear the mark of Christ for real. I'm a Christian. I just can't do that. I'm a Christian. I don't want to do that. Are you, to quote my favorite Bible teacher, are you being serious right now? <laughs> Come on now. What's our mark? The third angel warns of the terrible fate awaiting those who persist in Antichrist worship. And it's an amazing thing. God's grace even here. This is their last shot of repentance. This is the last time the gospel is presented. This is the last time from here on out. Oh man, the bold judgments are coming and it's going to get real bad. This is that deathbed, in quote, conversion opportunity right here. So we take a look now at verse 10. He says, if you have this mark of the beast, if you're worshiping the beast, you have his mark, what's going to happen? He himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God. Well, that's not good. The cup of God's wrath. That word wrath right there is thumos. It is the dam breaking wrath. It is the wrath that is reserved for the end times. This is the wrath that will overwhelm anybody and everybody. This is the wrath that you don't want to be around. This is the wrath of God. And it says here, whoever worships the beast, whoever has that mark of the beast, he himself, you've rejected Christ to the very end, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the thumas of God. A settled deliberate, merciless, graceless response of a righteous God against unrepentant sinners. This is not good. To drink of the wine of the wrath of God is to experience His wrath. It's used throughout the Old Testament. We're not going to turn there tonight because of time, but in Job chapter 21, verse 20, Psalm 75, verse 8, Isaiah 51, 17, 22, Jeremiah 25, 15. I can go on and on and on and on where we see the wrath of God being expressed by the drinking of the wine of the wrath of God. It is hitting the wrath of God, drinking the wrath of God, this orgate wrath that has been dammed up, so to speak, so long, and now God is just going to go, is taking that cup of God's wrath, and just as Babylon and the Antichrist made the people of the earth drink of that wrath, of fornication, God says, really, you're drinking of that? Now I'm going to make you drink the wrath of God poured into the cup of God's wrath. Notice what it says. He himself shall also drink of the wine of the thumas of God, which is poured out full strength. Poured out full strength. Literally, it's mixed, unmixed. It's wine diluted with water. Actually, it's water diluted with wine, if there is such a thing. You know, we, we tend to have a, a really skewed concept of wine in the Bible. And it's amazing when we try to justify partying, is it not? Well, Jesus made wine. Well, Jesus drank wine, so I can drink a little wine. Homer's Odyssey, he talks about the mixture of water and wine. And there he said it was 20 parts water. 20 cups of water for one cup of wine. So it's really a bunch of water with some wine poured into it. It's not water diluted. It's a bunch of water with a little bit of wine added. Now that's unusual. In biblical times, it was three to four parts water to one part wine. So take three to four cups of water and take a cup of wine and pour it into the water. Why would you do that? For two reasons. It was to purify the water, and a lot of the water was stagnant. And it tasted like stagnant water. But the wine made it palatable. And I know we can sit here and say, yeah, but if I'm going to drink biblical wine, I'm not going to get buzzed. Exactly. <laughs> you see, wine isn't to get buzzed. Proverbs talks about that. Don't look at wine that gets you buzzed. When it's bubbling and it's a port, don't do that because you act stupid. Anybody ever acts? I'm not going to go there, but you know how it is. <laughs> don't do that. Don't do that. That's not biblical wine. But this one says he's going to drink the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength. It is not going to be diluted. It is strong wine. 
It is the wine that um, makes a difference. It is the wine that has a bite. And it is a picture of literally mixed, unmixed. It is full strength. It is the wrath of God for real. No mercy, no grace. This is the wrath that is poured out on a Christ-rejecting people. And it's the cup of his wrath. And that's important. The cup of wrath is mentioned 13 times in Scripture. Interesting, if you're into numerology, I'm walking away from the pulpit now because it's numerology, you know. But numbers in Scripture have meanings and they represent certain issues. Remember what the number, anybody remember what 13 represents? Rebellion. Isn't that something? We even talk about when kids get to 13, oh, they're in the rebellious age now, you know. The 13 is the number of rebellion throughout Scripture. I find it so interesting that the wrath of God is mentioned, this cup of the wrath of God is mentioned 13 times against those who rebel against coming to Christ. I just find that interesting. I don't know. I'm back to the pulpit now. I just threw that out there. It's just interesting. But God holds this cup of wrath, and he makes those under judgment of God drink this thumos wrath, this cup of wrath. What makes it interesting, guys, is let's take a look at Matthew chapter 26. New believers, Matthew, New Testament, first book in the New Testament. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, John is about one, about two-thirds from the front of the Bible. If you kind of flip through it, you'll see Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. We're going to get into Matthew chapter 26. And in Matthew 26, we see Jesus. This is the night he's about ready to get arrested and getting ready to go to the cross. He knows it's coming. He's aware of that. And he's praying here in the Garden of Gethsemane, the, right just across the Kidron Valley there outside of Jerusalem. It's night now. And he's praying, and Jesus says something very interesting in verse 39. In verse 39... It says, Jesus went a little farther from the rest of the disciples that he had with him, those three of the inner circle, you know, James, John, and Peter. And he fell on his face, so he is seriously in prayer, and he prayed, saying, Oh, my Father, if it is possible, let this cup. This is the cup of God's thumas wrath that is going to be forced for Jesus. Well, Jesus is going to willingly drink it, his wrath, the wrath of God, when Jesus goes to the cross, the wrath of God is going to come down on the body of Jesus Christ. He's going to be separated from his Father, and God is going to judge the sin of the world onto Jesus. Jesus knows it. And he says, let this cup pass from me. If I don't have to drink this cup, I don't want to drink this cup of your wrath. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Do you realize the significance of that? Jesus willingly took the cup of God's wrath and drank it on the cross, the cup that you and I are supposed to drink from. But because Jesus drank from that cup, we don't have to if we place our faith in Jesus Christ for real. Now, if we don't, then first comes death and then the judgment. We're going to stand at the great white throne judgment, chapter 20 of Revelation. We'll get there next summer sometime. And when we get there, we're going to see this great white throne judgment. Those who have rejected Christ are going to be faced with this cup of God's wrath. And they will be sent forever into hell. A place that was created for Satan and his followers, not for you. It wasn't created for you. But if we reject Christ, we're choosing to follow him, to Satan. And we're choosing to go there. The enemy, I believe, right now in our country and in this planet right now on this planet is doing everything he can to get us not to look to Christ. To think of hell as just one of those old-fashioned things, it's not real. We're going to see tonight as we get into this, oh, hell is for real. It's a real deal. This is not a game we're playing. It's not, I hope I did enough to make it. And <laughs> that's not going to work. First John tells us, he says, I wrote these things that you might know you have eternal life. Not that you hope you have eternal life. Not that you kind of hope you did enough to get there. No, you're going to know it. Either you're a Christian and you're following Christ or you're not. Our choice, our choice. It's interesting as it goes back into verse 10. He himself shall also drink of the wine, speaking of the earth dwellers, of the wrath, the thumas of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. This indignation, if you write in your Bibles, you want to write wrath of God, that was that thumas wrath, T-H-U-M-O-S wrath, the word indignation. Do you know what the Greek word is for indignation? It's orge. 
It's the other wrath. It's orge wrath. So it talks about the cup of his orge. It's been storing up, storing up, storing up, storing up, storing up. And then God says these earth dwellers, okay, now guys, you're going to drink it. I don't want to drink it. You're drinking. Just as Babylon and the Antichrist made the earth dwellers drink of the wine of their fornication, there's coming a time when God will make them drink from the cup of the orge wrath. And they will experience this cup of indignation. They will experience the thumos wrath of God. It's a scary thing. Remember Jonathan Edwards, uh, that famous sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Those of you that are in church history class with, with Sandy, Sandy, you cover that, I'm assuming, yes? Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. It's an amazing thing, Jonathan Edwards. Many people have said that he's the brightest man to ever be born in the United States. He was so smart, his IQ was so high, he didn't have to tell people he was smart. <laughs> They could just tell by hearing him. He was homeschooled. <clears throat> a brilliant man. The sinners in the hands of an angry God. His main concern was that his homiletics would not detract from the word of God. If he was in our lit classes, we would be stopping the tape about every 10 seconds or, or, or maybe even less. Because it said he put on his spectacles, he had his little candle there, and he read it intentionally. He read his message in a monotone voice so as not to draw attention to himself, but rather the message would go out. And he read about hell, the message that God gave him. And except for the grace of God and the blood of Jesus, there is absolutely no reason that these floors, he said, right now should just not split open and just swallow every one of us live into hell right now, except for Jesus. And people started freaking out. Before he was done reading this monotone message, people started crawling up to the front, giving their life to Christ, rededicating their life to Christ. Because they got into their hearts that hell was real. Unfortunately, in the United States today, in the world today, in the church today, the concept of hell and the impending judgment is blown off. Is a Hollywood fictional event or place, and believers and unbelievers alike laugh at hell. It's the same situation that we see in the book of Isaiah with the Assyrians after taking away the northern ten tribes of Israel, the Assyrians are starting to come to Jerusalem and the word hits Jerusalem. The Assyrians are literally coming and these were the bad folks. Remember these are the ones that flayed people alive, skinned people alive, played uh, polo with people's heads, buried in the sand and go play polo with their swords. And These are some sick, sadistic people and they had destroyed many of the Israelis in the northern nation of Israel and now they were coming to Jerusalem. And the people of Jerusalem, as Isaiah would present, we need to repent. The judgment of God is coming through the Assyrians. They go, yeah, yeah, whatever, but did you see the great gladiator game? You know, this is that type of thing. You know, they're just, they weren't gladiators. You know what I'm saying. They were just looking at other stuff. So God, I think it's in chapter 20 of Isaiah, I hope I wrote it down. Maybe I did, maybe I didn't. Yep, Isaiah 20. In Isaiah 20, God tells something to Isaiah. He says, Isaiah, we've got to get their attention. We've got to get their attention. The people are ignoring the warning that the judgment of God is coming. Isaiah, I want you to do this. You're preaching and they're just going, yeah, whatever. He says, Isaiah, I want you to do this. I want you to take your sandals off. Okay. I want you to take your robe off. Say what? No, take your robe off. Isaiah, I want you to bury your body completely for three years. And I want you to walk up and down the streets of Jerusalem. Look it up in Isaiah 20. I want you to walk naked through Jerusalem. God tells Isaiah, this very dignified prophet, he says, get naked for the people. And you bear your body to get their attention. They need to wake up. The judgment of God is coming. You know what Isaiah did? He got naked. Three years. He bore his body to get the attention of God's people who have blown off the judgment of God that is coming for those who are lukewarm. Today we're not called to bear our body, 
but I want to encourage you to bear your soul. Bear your soul. Yeah, but people will laugh at me. You think they weren't laughing at Isaiah? Come on now. Come on. Have you ever been to New York City, the naked cowboy down in Manhattan? Down in Times Square? Anybody heard of that? I mean, he's doing it for who knows why. But we're called to bear our soul. Tell your family. Tell your friends. Yes, you're going to get mocked. Yes, you're going to be accused. Yes, false statements are going to be made about you. Of course. But this isn't a game. We bear our soul for Christ. We tell people of Jesus, for real, what the Lord has done in our life, and that there is a very real judgment awaiting those who are playing games with Jesus. I mean, raising a hand in church is not going to get us to heaven. Being friendly and making wassail is not going to get us to heaven. Working in kids' ministry is not going to get us to heaven. You don't have to go to church. You don't have to read your Bible. But we need to place our faith in Jesus Christ. And once we do that, we don't have to go to church ever. We get to go to church. We don't have to read our Bible. We get to read our Bible. We don't have to witness. We get to witness. It's a privilege. We do it because, those of you lit, you know, we serve with what? Gladness. We serve with gladness. We're glad to serve. We're glad to serve. It was Spurgeon that said, if you truly know this amazingly joy-filled, happy God, you can't help but happily, joyfully serve Him. Know God and serve God with gladness because He's God. We tell people of the Lord. It says this wrath will be poured out, the wrath of God. They'll be forced to drink the wine of the wrath of God in verse 10. The earth dwellers, those who reject Christ, which is poured out full strength, no mercy, no grace. We're talking wrath of God, full strength, into the cup of his stored up or gay wrath. He shall be tormented. The same word, remember in our Luke study, I don't remember who was teaching. I think it was Walter. Are you teaching on dives and Lazarus? Walter was teaching on Sunday nights. And when Pastor Walter was teaching, he talked about the rich man, remember, being in torments? Same word right here. The person who drinks of the wine of the wrath of God full strength, he shall be tormented. It speaks of ceaseless infliction. I can't begin to imagine that. Ceaseless infliction. We sing a song when we've been in heaven 10,000 years bright shining as the sun. We've no less days to sing God's praise. Then when we first begun, 10,000 years will be nothing in eternity. But can you imagine being tormented for 10,000 years ceaselessly and realizing that's like a second. It goes on forever. He will be tormented. Ceaseless infliction. It also speaks of unbearable pain, this word right here. It talks about never ending and unbearable pain. Remember Dives, the rich man in Hades, in the parable that Jesus told. He said, man, I'm down. He was very much aware. He said, I'm in torments down here. To drink the wine of the wrath of God. No moment of rest. Hell is real. It's not a good thing, this cup of indignation, this orge wrath. As we look at this, he says, he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone. Fire and brimstone. We, we see that a lot in Scripture. It speaks specifically with God's divine judgment. Remember, it was in Sodom and Gomorrah. We saw the fire and brimstone. David in Psalm 11 talks about fire and brimstone coming upon the wicked in Psalm 11.6. Hell is described as a lake of fire. This brimstone, if you look up brimstone, it's a sulfur thing, and it talks about this odor of sulfur dioxide. If, if any of you are ever into chemistry in high school or junior high, you get a little chemistry set, or you ever been in a chemistry class, you know burning sulfur has a very unique aroma. That's brimstone. So you've got this fire and you've got this stench. You've got this stench. He says he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone. It is used throughout the scripture to represent God's judgment. 
But it's interesting, he says, they'll be in this fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Not only will you be in hell, but you'll see Jesus there. Shame. Think of the shame. Worshiping Jesus. And you'll be in hell and he'll have that, he'll, you'll see him in hell. I think of that look that, the feeling that Peter had, remember? When Jesus looked at him and Peter just went out and wept. Remember, I'll never deny you, I'll never deny you. And there was Peter denying. And Jesus looked at him and it was like, ugh. God in hell, why would, I, why would I say that? Because that's what Psalm 139 says. Where can I run from God? If I go to the heavens, you're there. If I make my home, my bed in hell, you are there. The presence of God will be in hell. Not his relationship presence, not the loving fellowship presence, but his sovereignty and omnipresence presence. God will be there. It will not be the God of love, not his loving, oh, you poor thing. No. It'll be God the judge. Think about that forever. Unrepentant sinners. Those in hell will receive eternal punishment at the hands of God. Remember Matthew 10, 28. It says, don't worry about, don't fear him who can, can, can kill your body. Fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. That's who we fear, referring to God. We tend to sometimes paint God as this mealy-mouthed, it's okay, Hito, God. No, it's not okay, Hito. You know how we are as parents. You know how we are as friends. I've said this before. I played Little League peanut baseball for like seven-year-olds, eight-year-olds. My parents were there. And I'm going up to bat at this neighboring town. I'm playing with these neighboring town kids. And you're kind of nervous because you're playing with kids from the neighboring town and you're on this baseball team. And Man, that pitcher was fast. He was probably throwing that ball 15 miles an hour, you know, but you're seven. It's like, whoa. And the ball, phew. Strike. I'm just going to swing no matter what. It's way up there. I'm swinging. Two. I'm swinging. Strike three. Three pitches. You're out. And I just take my bat, go back to the dugout. Our coach was on third base, you know. And I go back to all my new friends from Bellevue there. And they, That's all right, Con. That's all right, Con. You'll get him next. That's all right, Con. This loud voice in front of my parents. This loud voice of the coach. No, that's not all right, Con. And like, oh, man, it's not all right. We tend to think God is like that. It's all right. You're trying. Six out of seven days is pretty good. That's not the heart of God. We're either all in or we're all out. We cannot be lukewarm. We cannot have one foot in and one foot out. We can't be thinking, well, I can party a little bit. No, we can't. God bless you, girl. You chose Jesus. Yvette's brand new Christian. Brand new. I don't know. I'm going to be a Christian. That's who we need to be encouraging. People are saying no to sin and saying no to baloney. Either we're all in or we need to get saved. For real. No game plan. We're in or we're not. And if we're in, let's get in. If we're not, let's get in. Let's get in. The strongest church in the world is one person sold out for Christ. Two people, look out. Three people, all right. Everybody and their dog is welcome here. Literally. But <laughs> we have dogs here. <laughs> so anybody's welcome. But let's be right. Let's get right. Let's get right. Let's not play games. Why? That's why. That's why. It's not so we can be elevated. It's not so we can be lifted up. Man, we are all stinking sinners. We know that. But because we're stinking sinners does not mean then it's okay for us to sin. And when we do sin, we need to repent of that sin. And when we finally say, I'm not going to do that. I've given my life to Christ. I'm not going to do that. That is not the butt of the jokes. That is the one who says, way to go. And we take encouragement from that. And just because I walked with the Lord for 40 years doesn't give me license to sin now. No. No. We walk with Jesus. So important. Well, those earth dwellers who reject Christ, play games with Christ, whatever, 
He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever. Literally, that word means into the ages of ages. It was the phrase in ancient Greek that described eternity. So it's saying this is going to last forever. So those who say, well, hell, you know, it's just a little bit of time. You go to hell for a while, it's not forever. Eventually, everybody's going to get saved. There's a Protestant version of purgatory going around. Now, purgatory is a true place. There is purgatory. The Roman Catholic Church teaches purgatory. Purgatory is for real. Connie and I were there. Did a wedding up there in Colorado. There is purgatory. <laughs> but there's not a purgatory after we die. No, 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 no. Purgatory is a ski basin up in Colorado. We stayed on Hades Street. Can you imagine? They said, okay, you get the wedding up here, you stay on Hades. Do you guys, you guys stayed town? Did you, what street did you stay on? You were on Hades too? Yeah, we hung out in Hades together. But it, it's, it's crazy. But there is no purgatory. Oh, wouldn't it be nice to get, okay, I can just live my life, do whatever I want to do. I'll just go to my, my priest, confess my sin, and then I'll just go to purgatory for a while, and then I'm good to go. It's just that it's not in the Bible. Hell is in the Bible. Jesus talks on hell, and he says forever. And Jesus says that the minute, the Bible says, the minute you die, if you know Christ, you're absent from the body. It doesn't say you're in purgatory. It says you're absent from the body in the presence of the Lord. So important to grasp that. So important. We're not going to get into the indulgences. We're not going to get into buying or taking money from people by promising they'll get out of purgatory. We're not going to even mention in the Middle Ages they, they would say if you buy this indulgence for X number of dollars we'll knock off two million years off your stay in purgatory. Well, how long are you in purgatory if that's going on? What is, what's going on here? We're not going to talk about that. I'm not going to talk about my cousin's dad who bought an indulgence in Dickinson, North Dakota for $100,000 from the Roman Catholic Church and was given a get out of hell free card and no purgatory card for $100,000. Not, not even going to talk about that. Not even going to talk about it. But it's out there and it's real. It's real. And it's bogus. The Roman Catholic Church has a lot of great doctrines. They teach the deity of Jesus. That's awesome. They teach the fact that Jesus died on the cross. That's great. They teach the importance of showing up. That's for sure. They teach discipline in their schools. Ever had a nun with a ruler around you? They, they teach it. That's some good stuff there. I'm not going to bash the Catholic Church. I'm not going to. But if it's wrong, it's wrong. And there are certain doctrines in the Roman Catholic Church, there are certain doctrines in the Evangelical Churches, there are certain doctrines in every church around that is questionable. If it's not based on the Word of God, just because a church leader says it, if it's not based on the Word of God, it's not right. Stick to the Word of God. Don't defend a non-biblical position just because, well, that's the church I go to. No, if it's wrong, it's wrong. If it's not biblical, it's not biblical. There is no perfect church but there is a blood-bought church with a perfect Savior. And that's what we're going to be part of. Simple as that. The smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever. The angel would strongly disagree with those who deny the eternal state of hell. So would Isaiah. So would Daniel. So would John the Baptist. So would Paul. So would Jesus, because all of them speak of the eternal nature of hell. So in closing, as we look at this, verses 6 through 11 here, it says, and they have no rest day or night. Think about that. No rest day or night. Torture all the time. Torment all the time. Those who worship the beast in his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. This we see in verses 6 to 11 as God's last call to repentance before this final judgment falls and the Lord Jesus Christ returns. Most of the earth dwellers at this stage are going to reject the gospel. Most of the earth dwellers are going to go on. In John 3.19 it says the reason for rejecting the gospel is that men love the darkness rather than the lights. For their deeds were evil. Have you noticed that when you were doing stuff that we know we shouldn't be doing, we do it at night? <laughs> you ever been caught doing something you know you shouldn't be doing and you're doing it and all of a sudden some Christian shows up and it's like what are they doing here? <laughs> hey, praise God, what's up? <laughs> mm -hmm. They love the darkness rather than the light for their deeds are evil. In our present time, 
American Christians, Christians worldwide, are not faced with the prospect of dying for our faith for the most part. Here in America especially, in Albuquerque, very few of us have been given the choice, be loyal to Christ or die. That's just not something that our country, we're not there yet. So we're not faced with the prospect of dying for our faith. But we are called to be diligent to live for our faith. Not to compromise, but to live for Christ. To be a Christian, unashamedly be a Christian. Develop a testimony for Christ. Not worrying about our reputation. Remember the reputation is what people think of us. It says in Philippians chapter 2, Jesus made himself of no reputation. We want to be like Jesus. We don't care about our reputation. We don't care what people think of us. But we want a testimony. What's a testimony? It's what people think of Jesus because of us. That's what we want to guard. So what people think of Christ because of us, that's different. That's what we want to guard. We guard our testimony. Our reputation, whatever. Testimony, huge. And that's what we're called to do. For us right now, we're not called to die for Christ, but we are called to live for Christ. And I want to encourage us as we look at this last proclamation of the gospel and the promised judgment and the guaranteed damnation for those who reject the gospel, it's very real. So when we go out into the world, it's a matter of telling people of Jesus for real, sharing the gospel for real, letting people see Jesus in us for real, giving glory to God for real. And I want to encourage you, enjoy your relationship with Jesus for real. If you know the Lord, you can't help it. It's just people are going to see Jesus in you. That's just what it is. If you don't know the Lord, man, it's time to know Jesus. It really is. He loves you. God loves you so much. He's got something for you, and it's called forgiveness and eternal life with him, for real. Free gift for you. A matter of placing our faith in Christ. So when you're talking with folks, share the gospel. You know the gospel, share the gospel. If you're here tonight and say, I just want to get right, well then get right. I don't have to lead you in a prayer. You know if you're not right, get right. Just get right. The Bible tells if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Might need to do that, then let's do that. The Bible says to whoever receives the Lord Jesus Christ, to them he gives the right, the privilege of becoming a child of God. If you don't know the Lord, you want to receive Jesus, do that. Do that for real. You know what's up. Confess your sin and place your faith in Christ. Bam, it's done. It's done. It's not a time to play games right now, guys. It really isn't. Hell is for real. It's not for you. Don't choose to go there. Don't be deceived to go there. It wasn't created for you. But the enemy will do whatever he can to get our eyes off of Jesus and to indulge in whatever it is he can bring our way to get our eyes off of the Lord and to go the wrong direction. The good news is, is God forgives. In Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34, he not only forgives the new covenant, he forgets. Think about that. We confess our sin, it's done. People will remember it and bring it up. Not the Lord. It's gone. The blood of Jesus is gone. People need to know that. Go tell them. Let them know why you're happy. It's not enough to say Jesus is the reason for the season. That's a start. Then tell them about Jesus. Let folks know what Jesus has done for you and what he is available for them to do. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this time just to kind of walk through this little section of Revelation. And God, as we uh, look at this, uh, a reminder again that there is a very real eternity waiting for each of us. And where we spend that eternity is really based on how and what we do now, how we live and what we do now. God, help us not to fall victim to the temptation, the luring of the enemy, the craziness of our flesh. God, help us to walk with our eyes firmly fixed on you. And Lord, right now in the quietness of the moment, there might be some of us who want to just recommit our walk to you. God, we thank you for a baby Christian that you protected her. God, and you, you just protected her. I thank you for that. And God, I pray that you protect each and every one of us who are confronted with, with sin and temptation, Lord, that we would not give in. 
But Lord, we would truly, truly, truly stand for you. Choose to do what is right and glorious for you that would bring glory to you. Lord, we pray for our brothers and sisters that couldn't be here tonight. We pray you watch over them, protect them, bless them. We pray for the churches in Albuquerque, Lord, the big churches, the little churches, the middle-sized churches. God, we pray they would shine bright for you. You would bless and that this city would truly come to know that there is a God for real and that there is a hell for real and that thousands upon thousands upon hundreds of thousands would choose to follow Jesus Christ. So God, we pray for our family members that are drifting away, have drifted away. We pray for our friends that are not walking with you. We, we pray for our neighbors and our acquaintances and our co-workers and whatever else comes into our way, God, we pray that you would use our lives as a testimony to bring people to Christ. In Jesus' name, amen.